Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Today, a story from the files of the world-renowned Pinkerton National Detective Agency, the first law enforcement agency doing detective and police work in the United States. It was founded by Alan Pinkerton in 1850 and carried on by his son, William and Robert. Such was their reputation that, it has been said, had they been guarding President Lincoln that night at Ford's Theater, Lincoln would never have been assassinated. But today, we pull the files marked train robberies. Uh, tell me again, Mr. Newton, what you remember of the robbery of the Rock Island train. Oh, I'm glad to, Mr. Pinkerton. <laughs> they say the Pinkertons always get their man. Well, we try to. I'll be frank with you, Mr. Newton. We have been keeping track of you. Keeping track of me? You mean, you mean you've been having me followed? I'm afraid I do. Well, I'll be... I'm... Am I under suspicion? In a case like this, everyone is suspect. Our mystery drama, The Pinkerton Method, was dramatized from the files of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, especially for Mystery Theater, by James Haggett, Jr., and stars Ian Martin and Lloyd Batista. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Crime was an everyday national threat in every American city from the Civil War to World War I. In New York, Baltimore, Chicago, and Boston, People were afraid to walk the city streets after dusk. Citizens would be robbed or they'd completely disappear. Gunmen fought daily battles right in the open streets. One of the most lucrative forms of crime was the train robbery. And the only law enforcement agency able to stem the tide of lawlessness were the Pinkertons. But who tell this story better than someone who was there? Harold Black is the name. It makes sense for me to give you the facts about the Rock Island train robbery because I'm pretty much the only person who knows what happened. I was a brakeman on the night express running out of Chicago that wintry March night with snow everywhere. I walked into the express car right behind the locomotive. Uh, hello, Harold. We on schedule? As far as I know, golly, it's nice and warm in here. What are you doing? Oh, you know, as usual. Making sure the $22,000 are all accounted for. You got that much in the safe? Not a dollar more, not a dollar less. You're a lucky stiff, Nick. Being an express messenger is such an easy job, sitting here, doing paperwork at a desk in the express car. <laughs> I really envy you. Well, now, what's the matter? You can wear a collar, a shirt, and a tie in this job. Look at me. Dirty overalls, my hands all banged up, greasy from oil cans, hey, 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 fingernails hey. dirty. Fifteen years, nowhere to go. Ah, it's too long, Nick. Nobody on the line appreciates how hard a brakeman has to work. Well, like I told you before, Harold, I'll put in a good word for you with the chief up at U.S. Express, if you like. He's an old pal of mine. Maybe he can use an extra messenger, huh? <laughs> Besides, we messengers don't do too bad when it comes to salary. Don't rub it in. And you could learn to work, Harold. It's easy. I think this time I'll take you up on that. I sure could use the money with a new wife and everything. Will you ask him? Okay, it's a promise. When we get back from New York, I'll talk to the chief. Uh -huh. Of course, your job's a little more dangerous than mine. Huh? Oh, you mean train robbers? Well, <laughs> I guess I've been lucky so far. I mean, say, one of the gangs knew you had 22000 in that safe. They could get aboard anywhere after Joliet. 
Hey, what do we do to arrive there? Half an hour. Pick up the mail, and then our next stop is Morris. Oh, Morris, Illinois. Yeah. I've been there. What a dead town. Now, hand me the poker, will you? Fire's getting low. I want to give the stove a stir. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Well, I'd better be heading back, Nick. Do my train rounds. Now, say hello to George G. Newton for me, will you? He's on this run the baggage car, isn't he? If he isn't asleep. He's supposed to sort all the baggage before we hit Morris. I'll bet anything all he's doing is snoring. <laughs> well, wake him and tell him I said to get busy. Okay. I don't want to be hanging around Pennsylvania Station when we get in. Oh, hey, I forgot to ask you, Harold. What? What's your wife's name? Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah, Elizabeth. That's a sweet name. I'll bet she's just as sweet as she sounds. Well, no kidding. I'll try to see if I can get you that job with U.S. Express. I won't be surprised, but you'd make double the money. I'm all for that. I made the rounds, ten cars, baggage car included, the length of the train and back. We pulled into Morris and took on water for the engine. George Newton, the baggage master, and I opened the express car door. I'll go first. What's the hurry, George? Well, I gotta be sure that... Oh, Lord, no. Huh? Harold, Harold, look. This is terrible. Look, I... I'd better, I'd better get the Pinkerton man. He's in the third car. The safe's blown open. Don't touch anything. If there was 22,000 in there once, it sure ain't in there now. Look at all that blood. Oh, I was afraid of this, Harold. I'm scared. W what do you mean? I can't take time to explain. I I'm going back for the Pinkerton man. And don't touch anything. <laughs> My name is William Pinkerton. I told the baggage man what's his name. Uh, Newton. George Newton. Yes, I asked him to wait in his car for me. I thought I'd speak to you first. You're, um... Uh, Harold Black. I'm the brakeman. And the name of the deceased, the express passenger? Nicholas Kelsey. Nicholas Kelsey. Hmm. And what was the last time you saw Mr. Kelsey alive? N not an hour ago. We were half an hour out of Joliet. I see. He was uh, alive when you left him? Mr. Pinkerton, of course he was. I swear it. Good Lord, he was even going to put in a good word for me with his chief so I could perhaps get a job with U.S. Express. Oh, why would he do that? Well, I, I just got married, and it's no secret, but a brakeman on the Chicago and Rock Island didn't make much money. I see. Gang of train robbers must have come aboard after we left Joliet and killed him. Mm -hmm. And you heard nothing, no shots, nothing. I was probably as far back as the last car. How much was in that safe, Mr. Black, or don't you know? Well, sure I know. Nick told me. $22,000. Uh-huh, I see. All right, will you ask Mr. Newton to join us? Uh, Georgie? George, Mr. Pinkerton wants to talk to you. Uh, I'm George Newton, Mr. Pinkerton. Uh, I think I told you. Oh, Lord, this car is a mess. Well, it looks like Nick put up an awful fight. And what can you tell us, Mr. Newton? Well, uh, the way I figured it, it must have happened between the time the train left Joliet and uh, when we stopped here in Morris. So there was this noise of broken glass, and I, well, I looked up and I saw the ventilator on the side of the baggage car was smashed. Well, and at that moment, a man with a black mask over the lower part of his face came into the car. Well, why didn't you call for help, Georgie? I couldn't have been far away. Yeah, well, the masked man said that if you dare move an inch, that man up there will blow your brains out. The man up where? Well, yeah. well, there wasn't a man uh, exactly, Mr. Pinkerton. It was a hand, uh, a man's hand pushed through the broken ventilator and the muscle of a pistol pointed right at me. And then what did you do? Nothing, really. I, I, I just tried to keep breathing. I, I was rooted to the spot. Well, the man in the mask left my baggage car and went through to the express car. Oh, you must have felt. Oh, I was in agony, believe me, Mr. Pinkerton. But I, I daren't give the alarm, you know, that that gun was aimed right at my head. Well, then, finally, I guess, when we pulled into Morris, I looked up in the ventilator and the hand was gone. And just then, Harold came in, and we went right into the express car, and, uh, well, the rest you know. Mr. Pinkerton, do you have any idea how Nick was killed? Looks like a pistol wound on the right shoulder. There may be others. The head wounds, I 
I can't say what made those. Pistol whipping, maybe. Oh, how terrible. Mr. Newton, are you sure you didn't hear any gunshots? Well, I, I couldn't swear I didn't. You know, the train makes pretty much of a racket going 50. I was, uh, I, well, I don't know what I was with that gun pointed at me. I, I don't know how many there were, but I knew they were after the money. You didn't hear them blow out the safe? And I wish I had. I, I mean, I wish I could say I did. And how much was it? Uh, 22000 You know, or you're guessing? Oh, no, no, I'm just guessing. And no one's touched anything in this car so far, as you know. When George was getting you, Mr. Pinkerton, I stood right there. No one came in here. And I think I found what they beat him with. What? Back here in the corner. A stove poker. Yeah, it appears to be blood on it. All right. You gentlemen can return to your duties for a moment. Tell the engineer I'm impounding this express car. Have him uncouple and move it to a siding right here at the station. And then he can take the rest of the train on to New York. You mean George and I can go along with the train? No, I don't mean that. I'm going to need both of you to help me. I believe there's a hotel in town. Oh, yes, I can see one from here. I'll make that my headquarters. If the telegrapher is still up, have him wire Chicago to have the Rock Island put you both up at that hotel until I give the word. George and I got rooms at the Delaney right on Thompson Street. I had the telegraph operator wire Chicago what had happened. And somebody had better notify Nick's wife, Mrs. Kelsey. I had him also get a message to Elizabeth. There'd been a delay on the run. Not to worry about me, but I was all right. Yeah, here she goes. Seems funny to be standing here in the window of this hotel watching our train pull out and we've got to stay here. Listen, so long as the Rock Island pays me my wages... I don't care where I am. Hmm. I wish Elizabeth was here. She loves hotels. You know, when we left Chicago and I was talking to Nick, you know, he said this town of Morris is a dump, a dead town, he said. Uh, let's not talk about Nick, okay? Uh, yeah, I, I wonder, wonder if it... Uh, well, I, uh, what were you going to say, Harold? You wonder what? Oh, nothing, I guess. Just wondering why Mr. Pinkerton was so insistent on our staying here. Well, I, I don't know. I don't like seeing that express car in the siding right from this window and, and knowing what's in it. Well, we've told Mr. Pinkerton all we knew. Well, you know, it could have been any of uh, half a dozen gangs. The Youngers, Jameson's, Dalton's, the McCoy's. <laughs> hey, Georgie, you really know your train robbers. Well, I read the newspaper a lot. But it could have been. Oh, sure. Could have been any of them. What time is it, Harold? Uh, eight o'clock. Well, we've been up all night. Yeah, and I'm beginning to feel all this. I'd say we're entitled to the best breakfast the Delaney can come up with. Let's go on downstairs and have us one. <laughs> Agreed. After what we've been through, the best breakfast is none too good for us. From the 1870s on, there was hardly an American train going anywhere that was not robbed. Bands of outlaws would pile on the rails, derail trains, shoot at the passengers while the express car was being dynamited. Traveling by train in those days was hell on wheels. Only the Pinkertons, with their network of operatives, were equipped to fight off the bandit buccaneers and murderers. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Before the Iron Horse started rolling the rails across country, the Pinkertons chased and captured desperados and stagecoach bandits. Before there was even a thought of a Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Pinkertons were the only law enforcement agency of any size who could get any results. Alan Pinkerton, who founded the agency in 1850, set a pace and a practice never forgotten by his two sons, William and Robert. In the early days, the Pinkertons pursued lawbreakers on horseback, now they were tracking and trailing by telephone. Hello? Hello? Robert? Bob? Are you there? Is that you, Billy? Yeah. Well, how's everything in Denver? Busy? <laughs> we got five inches 
the snow here. <laughs> we got 12 where I am. Where's that, you lucky bum? Morris, Illinois. The Rock Island was robbed of $22,000. With you on the train, Billy? Oh, what kind of a Pinkerton are you? All right, Bob, now cut that out. You know very well we try to apprehend robbers, not anticipate them. Any clues? Well, not too many. There were two robbers, according to a witness, the baggage master on the train. One held them at bay, and the other must have killed the messenger and dynamited the safe. Could have been more than two. What did they use? Well, it looks like number four dino. The coarse grain dynamite? I'd say. The uh, messenger was shot. I'm having the bullet removed from the body now to see if I can identify it. Sounds like the wild bunch. They've been hitting Illinois. Butch Cassidy? No, I'm not so sure. In addition to being shot, the messenger's skull was smashed in with a poker. That's not Cassidy style. So what have you got to go on, Billy? Well, the eyewitness account and the clues don't match up. Right here, outside the Morris Depot, I found a black mask a few feet from the express car, but not one footprint. And I walked a track in 12 inches of snow. Well, the baggage man claims he was threatened from the top of the car, but there are no footprints there either. No, nope, that's not a gang, then. I'll say, what's your next move, Billy? I'm not sure. I need to do a little more talking, a little more listening. Why, do you need me, Bob? Well, we just got word the Mobile in Ohio has been held up. They took the Southern Express Company for $20,000. Shot the express messenger in the chest. Was it fatal? Well, I don't know how close to death he is, but I'm leaving for Union City to try and get him to talk before he dies. Will you join me down there? Well, where's down there? Union City, Tennessee. Okay, I will, as soon as I can. Can you be there by Friday? I don't know, Bob. I'll try. I'll get there when I get there. You asked me to come up to your room, Mr. Pinkerton? Yeah, I did, Mr. Black. You don't mind if I call you Harold? Oh, of course. Sure. Well, it's been a couple of days. Any ideas how it happened? Oh, yeah. Lots of ideas. That's good. Does that mean I can leave this dump and get myself back to Chicago and my wife? <laughs> it certainly does. But then you're onto something, Mr. Pinkerton. Hmm? Well, not exactly. Look, Harold, I don't mind confessing to you that there are quite a few aspects of this case which do not add up, you know. I'd even go so far as saying it's downright mysterious and... Well... I'd like you to give me as much help as you can. Whatever assistance I can be, I want to. Nick Kelsey was a good friend, and I really want to do anything I can to track down his killer. Uh, you know George Newton, the baggage master, of course. Georgie? He's very well indeed. Good. Harold, I want you to do a little detective work for me. There is some suspicion pointing in his direction. Now, I'm releasing you both so you can get back to Chicago. But I'm asking Rock Allen to assign you to the home office in case I need you both. So you won't be going out on any more runs for a few weeks. That suits me just fine. My wife will love that. My working in the roundhouse, coming home nights. I, I, I just got married, you know. Yeah. Now, when you're back in Chicago, I want you to associate as much as you can with George Newton and get him to, to talk about the case. You know, the, the masked man and the broken ventilator and the gun pointing at him what time it was and so on. And each night, I want you to call the Pinkerton office in Chicago and make a full report of what you've learned that day. I will, Mr. Pinkerton. As I said, anything I can do to bring the assassin to justice. But so far as Georgie goes, I think there you're barking up the wrong tree. Well, that may be, Harold, but we have to bark up all the trees. You do that and we'll see what develops. I, uh, I won't be in Chicago, but they'll know you by a code number. Where are you going to be? Right now, I've gone about as far as I can go on this case, so I'm going down to Tennessee on another train robbery. Now, don't forget now. You're calling each night. Oh, here, um, let me write down the telephone number for you and the code you identify yourself with. Keep rolling, Billy. You're doing great. I get bit to death of these darn chiggers, Bob. How much further is it to Lester's Landing? Well, I think we're almost there. They told me at Hickman the landing was just ten miles into this swamp. Uh, rolling after dark through a 
Tennessee Swamp isn't my idea of fun, believe me. <laughs> Since when was the Pinkerton Detective Agency in the amusement business? <laughs> <laughs> to think a week ago I was looking for footprints in 12 inches of snow at Candle. <laughs> Must be 110 degrees right now. You're pretty sure it's the Farrington brothers we're looking for. Absolutely. I asked the express messenger twice just to make sure I heard right. Hillary and Levi Farrington. Those were his last words before he died. Oh, he recognized them all right. He'd seen all our flyers and posters on their last job when they hit the mobile in Ohio and Kentucky. It's too bad we couldn't go overland to track them. Could have had a posse with us. Well, we'll have the element of surprise. That'll help us get the drop on them. Hey, wait a minute. Look. That a skiff with a man in it? Yeah, so it is. An old fellow fishing. Uh, <clears throat> hey there. Huh? Who's, who's that? Uh, we're looking for Lester's Landing. Hey, will you talk more quiet? Can't you see him fishing? What you want to do, scam a dinner away? Oh, sorry, we're, we're looking for Lester's Landing. Well, who are you? What are you Yankees doing here? We're looking... Uh, uh, Bob, will you let me... How's the fishing? Tolliver. He better if some folks didn't make so much noise. <laughs> my name is Bill Pink. This is my brother, Bob. We're looking for two friends of ours. You can never find friends when you want them, I always say. Uh, Levi and Hillary Farrington. Maybe you know them. Farrington? Never heard of them. In Tennessee, are they? Yeah. Lester's Landing, eh? Yeah, is that far? Just around that bend there. See, Billy, what'd I tell you? I don't mix much with other folk. Keep to myself, mostly. Oh, just around the bend, you say? Fine. Well, we'll, we'll be moving along. Yeah, thank you. Well, good luck, boys. Keep the powder dry. Hey, I think you got me by. Be one. Billy, this is it. Now, let me tie this end of the rowboat to the dock. Shh, shh, shh. I'll climb out and give you a hand. Okay, fine. Hard to see. I'm just as glad there isn't a moon tonight. I don't want to be spotted before we're ready. Oh, that must be the shack they're in. Oh, small, isn't it? I can see some shadows around that table with the lantern on it. Come on. Let's start crawling up the dock. Keep low. Hey, Bob. What? Look. We're after two Barringtons. But who's to say they haven't got a lot of friends with them? Well, when we get a little closer, maybe we can hear something. Over here. Down by that window. It's open. Tom, you stupid. Now, I've been doing this for years, and the way I tell you to make the nitro soup is the only way. Well, sure, sure, Levi. I always know everything better than anybody else. You shut up and hear me now. Now, you take 75 sticks of dino, and you thaw it out near the stove. And then, you crumble it up like sawdust, see? Now, oh, watch me. Now, pour hot water on it and stir Slowly, stupid. Now stir it up. Oh, sure, sure. But that's not that's not the way we make it, isn't it, right? Now, when it's smooth like that, would you watch me? Now, I squeeze it through a rag. Now, pour the water off the top. <laughs> and look in there. <laughs> look in the bottom of the can. Now, that is good, strong soup. Now, why don't you try it my way? Hey, well, when I need advice on how to blow a safe, I'll ask for it, huh? Now, Hillary... I want you to mosey on down to Hickman to see if you can locate some more dino. Now, they've been blasting the road down there. Now, you just pick yourself to as many sticks as you can carry. Now, do you hear me, boy? There he goes. That's Hillary, Levi's brother. Well, I'll follow him. Can you handle Levi and whoever else is in there? Yeah. I'll just walk in that screen door and play it by ear. I can always shout out and pretend we surrounded the place with a posse. If it looks bad, I'll, I'll shoot out the lantern. Well, I better go, Billy, before I lose Brother Hillary. Good luck. Hi there. Anyone home? Uh, who's that? Well, I think I'm lost. I'm looking for Tiptonville Road. Oh, oh, are you? Ah. Uh, no, it's around here somewhere. Uh, how, how did you get here, stranger? Well, matter of fact, I rode. 
Oh, well, you just little old road, huh? Yeah, and I got the mosquito bites to prove oh, it. Oh, well, now, what'd you say your name was? Well, I didn't say, but... Hey, Tim, that's your fellow I was telling you about, Levi. Well, hi there, old man. I didn't expect to see you here. I came all right, Levi. Said he was a friend of yours. Oh, as a friend of mine, huh? Now, let me hold up this lantern a little higher to see him better. Hmm. Well, I always like to wake him, old friend. He knows your name, Levi. And who do we? Said his name was Bill Pink. Bill Pink? That's Bill Pinkerton. He shut out the light. I warn you, Farrington, this is the end of the line. Put on your guns and put up your hands. Uh, maybe I can't see you, Pinkerton, but I can hear you. <laughs> All right, man. Move on in. We've got a 50-man party outside. <laughs> shut, Levi. I'm here. I can't see a cursed... Hold your fire, man. Farrington may want to stay alive. He's ready to give up. Not so long as I have any ammunition left. Levi, help me. Help me, I'm... Uh, hey, you uh... killed the old man. Levi Farrington, I just put your brother out of commission. Will you come quietly? Come get... Uh, Billy, 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 where are you? Uh, uh, here, I... Levi was trying to get away. I tackled him. Oh. All right. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me light this lantern. Oh. Billy, you did it. Uh, Levi is out cold. Well, it makes it easier to snap the handcuffs on him. Uh, oh, there's a body over here on the floor. Say, hey, isn't that the old man we ran into fishing? Yeah, uh, how is he? Uh, looks like his fishing days are over. He kept the wrong company. You'd think at his age he'd know better. Where's Hillary Farrington? Oh, he's out there handcuffed to a tree. Oh, my Lord, Billy, your shoulder's bleeding. Well, those slugs fly around everywhere in the dark. You got your corn knife handy, Bob? Oh, sure I do. Here, give me the lantern. I'll hold it. Okay, take your knife, Bob, and dig out the slug. Oh, uh, this is going to hurt a little. Well, yeah, don't you worry, Bob. That little old bullet has done me a big favor. Hold still. Hey, what favor? Uh, sure helps me to forget those mosquito bites. <laughs> Snow, swamps, mountains, forests, trails, whatever the terrain or the weather, Robert and William Pinkerton did more to put an end to train robberies than any other security outfit in the world. The Farrington case closed. Robert returned to Denver headquarters. William went back to Chicago. The case of the Rock Island theft and murder was yet to be solved. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. accomplishments of the Pinkertons had set the example for all the law enforcement agencies that have come after. What was their system? How did they either capture or kill or gather evidence that put an end to every train or bank robber? Their secret, keep moving, never rest, pursue the criminal on horseback across oceans, never letting up until he is either dead or behind bars. That was the Pinkerton method. Robert? Bob, is that you? Of course it is, Billy. <laughs> I can't get used to this telephone invention. It's not that newfangled. Oh, here I am in Chicago and talking to you, Bob, and Denver like it's in the next room. What's the problem, Billy? Well, by the way, how's the shoulder? Oh, that's doing fine. Good thing it's my left arm. I don't mind having that bandaged up in a sling. <laughs> Look, Bob, I'll tell you what I called you about. You remember the Rock Island case and our best witness, Harold Black, the brakeman? Yes, I do. What about him? Well, I took him into my confidence and had him do a little detective work following the baggage master, George Newton, and reporting to the office every day while I was in Tennessee with you. I also had our operatives follow the both of them. Now, I've been going over what our man says about Newton's movements and comparing them with Harold Black's reports, and they just don't jive. Say that again, Billy. I don't think I caught that. Well, I said the reports phoned in by the brakeman are all made up. They're all lies. The places Newton is supposed to have gone to and so on, you know. Oh, I'd say from here, looks like they're in this thing together. Oh, it sure looks like it. Anyway, Bob, the reason I put through this call to you is that Harold Black has asked for leave of absence from the Rock Island. I told the general superintendent to grant it, and Black is starting west with his new wife. 
Keep them under surveillance, will you, Bob? Mr. and Mrs. Harold Black is how we mark the tags on our luggage. It was really like a honeymoon. And Elizabeth and I were sure looking forward to it. Elizabeth wanted us first to go to Niagara Falls, but I said, let's head west first. On the way home, we'll make a side trip to the falls. Women are romantic that way. So off we went, westward. Everything we saw, everywhere we went, we had ourselves a great old time. And, of course, we had money to spend. Ah, uh, come in, come in, Mr. Newton. Uh, Mr. Pinkard, I'm glad to see you again. You've uh, been away from Chicago on another case. Yes, I have. I, uh, I asked you to stop by, Mr. Newton. No, by the way, you don't mind if I call you George? Yeah, sure, no, not at all. George, I, I thought I'd like you to tell me again just what you remember. Hey, well, I, I'm glad to, Mr. Pinkerton. It's uh, fresh in my mind, like that awful morning when I last saw you. But uh, I guess things like that happen every day in your life. Huh? It's not for me. I, I like quiet life. I've been keeping track of your quiet life, George. Keeping track of me? Uh, do, you, do you mean... I'm that... afraid I do. I had you followed. Yes, George. Well, I'll be... I just, look, am I under suspicion? In a case like this, everyone is suspect. You know, it's a little warm in here. I don't know why they keep these officers so hot. I've asked them not to. No, well, I don't mind. Why don't you take your overcoat off? Huh? No, 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 I won't bother. I don't expect to be with you that long. You sure it's not too hot for you? No, 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 no. Oh, and uh, now you want me to remember it all over again, huh? Well, right here goes. Uh, as I told you uh, two weeks ago, I was moving boxes in the baggage car, and, uh, well, I'd say it happened between the time uh, we left Joliet and stopped at Morris. Now, there uh, was this noise that broke glass. Well, I looked up, and I saw the ventilator that uh, had been smashed. And at that moment, a man with a black mask over the lower part of his face came into the car and said, If you dare move an inch, that man up there will blow your brains out. Huh? Well, I looked up. And the muzzle of a pistol was pointed right at me through the broken ventilator. Well, the man with the mask left. When we pulled into Morris, I looked up again, and the hand holding the pistol was gone. And, well, that's, uh, you know, that's what I remember, Mr. Pinkerton. Uh-huh. Word for word. Hmm? What do you mean? That's just the way you told it to me last time. Word for word. Yeah, yeah. Is that suspicious? Well, let's say it isn't usual. George, are you sure you don't wish to take your coat off? As I say, this office has always been overheated. All right, it's so sure. And it'd be easier if you'd first take off your gloves, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, my goodness, whatever happened to your hands? Yeah, they're pretty scratched up, aren't they? But that's the nature of my job. What is? Here, uh, I'll hang your coat up. Uh, handling baggage is rough on them. You know, I thought the Rock Island gave you a desk job since you came back here to Chicago. Oh, yeah, yeah they did. Uh, these scratches? Well, I'd say they happened a month ago. Takes a long time to heal, doesn't it? Uh, may I ask, Mr. Pinkerton, when your man followed me, I mean... Well, actually, uh... you were followed by two men. One was our Pinkerton operative, and the other was a friend of yours. Oh, would you uh, like to see his reports? A friend of mine? Well, you're kidding. Well, he said he was. Here. Have a look at his report. Yeah. Report on George Newton by Harold Black. Harold? You don't actually I mean I certainly it. do mean. In your hand is one week of reports, including Sunday. Where you went, what you did, what you two talked about. I, I don't believe it. Why, that dirty two-timing bigamist. Bigamist? Harold Black? Oh, yeah, you didn't know about your pet spy, did you? So he two-timed me just like he's two-timed his own wife. Uh, oh, yeah, he's got a wife in Philadelphia and two children. Deserted him last year. So Elizabeth is not Harold's wife. Oh, no, no, she thinks she is. But, uh, not, no, she's a nice girl. She's too nice for him. That's what makes me so darn mad. Yeah, well, well, the things that finally come to light, huh? So, frankly, if I were you, Mr. Pinkerton... I'd take Harold's reports about me with a grain of salt. Well, I'll most assuredly bear that in mind. All right, George, I won't keep you any longer today. You mean I can go now? Yes. 
Oh, and George, you should have those hands looked at. You wouldn't want to get an infection. It was just bad luck. I should have waited a little longer before flashing those fifties and hundreds. But the feel of having big money was just too much for me, I guess. And sweet Elizabeth. Oh, she was having the time of her life. Omaha, Tulsa, Albuquerque, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and then California. Seeing all the sights, theaters, shows, restaurants, we had ourselves a time. It was sheer luck that day in San Francisco that she was upstairs in the hotel room resting. I was alone downstairs in the bar when I felt a hand on my shoulder. Harold Black? Yes. Who are you? Robert Pinkerton. I believe you've made the acquaintance of my brother, William. Oh, I certainly have. Wonderful fellow. Enjoying yourself? <laughs> you bet. My wife and I have never been to San Francisco before. Oh, I thought your wife was in Philadelphia. What? Don't make a fuss. Have you paid for your drink? Yes. Then finish it quietly. Take your hat and coat and come with me. But I... I haven't done anything. Uh, this is my vacation. It's as far from Philadelphia as you're going to get, Mr. Black. Come along. But... What, what's the charge? Bigamy. Who told you? Your friend George Newton told us. George. And we checked it out and found your real wife. Now, those are two fine children you left behind you. Mr. Pinkerton, uh, did George say anything else about me? Well, yes, uh, a few things. Finish up your drink, Mr. Black. Let's go. Pinkerton turned me over to the police who escorted me back to Chicago. I told Elizabeth to stay in San Francisco and not to worry. I'd be back, I said. I got me a good lawyer, and with $2,000 cash bail, I was a free man again. For just about one hour. Then I was rearrested, charged with murder. That was bad. Very bad. Billy, I'm still in San Francisco with the... Well, I guess you'd call her the second Mrs. Black, Elizabeth. Oh, any progress, Bob? I had a little talk with her, and I think she trusts me. I told her I would try to help her. She's really too nice a girl to be involved with this Harold character. Anyway, she has an explanation where Harold got the money he's been throwing around. I'd like to hear it. She says he found it under a seat in one of the passenger cars. <laughs> found it? Well, that's what he told her, Billy. I'm mailing you all the money she had in their luggage so you can check the serial numbers against the U.S. Express record. All right, thank you, Bob. I'll take it from there. Well, good luck. Uh, say, any news on your end? Well, we got a medical report that says they discovered human skin underneath the fingernails of the deceased. Looks like to save his life, he scratched someone pretty bad. The trouble was, I didn't know how much the Pinkertons knew. I didn't know how much Elizabeth knew or had told them. Worst of all, I couldn't be sure of Georgie. Was he in cahoots with the Pinkertons? I didn't know, but I didn't think so. Because if he started to sing, he must be aware I know the same tune. If he ratted on me, I sure wasn't going to take the rap alone. Harold, we've got a visitor, George Newton. Hi, Harold. I'll leave you two. I've got some business with the chief of police. <laughs> well, locking me in here, huh? They don't trust us. Should they, Georgie? Should anyone? Uh, what do you mean, Harold? All I'm asking is, are you to be trusted? Well, what a question. Of course I am. I'm your friend. Are you, Georgie? Who was it who told the Pinkertons I had a wife in Philadelphia? Would a friend say that? Uh, now, 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 hold on. Uh, if you're talking about friendship, would a friend peach on me, huh? Give reports to the Pinkertons about where I went and what we talked about? You stupid fool. I didn't tell them a thing. Made it all up. They wanted information on you, so I pretended to go along with them to take the heat off us. Not so loud. Now, listen. I asked to see you saying I wanted to straighten things out with your wife in Philadelphia. Now, Pinkerton's on to something. 
He saw these hands. See, I, I don't know if he believed that I got it handling baggage or not, but why he didn't believe me, that's what I want to know. Why is he suspicious? That's your problem. Georgie, I don't want to talk to you. I'm the one charged with murder. You're out there free. No, I am not going to say anything. You'd better not. You'd better not threaten me. The whole thing was your idea. Oh, it was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're going to tell the Pinkertons? I don't play footsie with them or send them reports like some people I know. Don't fool yourself, Georgie. With this, it was all my idea business. If I go, you go. You're the one who shot Nick. He was already dead when I hit him with that poker. You're crazy. I got him in the shoulder. The gun went off because he was fighting like a tiger, clawing at me. I wasn't going to kill him. Now, you're the one who panicked when, when your mask fell off and, and, and you thought he recognized you, so you smashed his skull with that poker. You liar, you. Help! Help! Let me out of here! The man, man's crazy. Right, hold on now. What's the trouble? Get, get me out of here, Mr. Pinker. You're a liar. That's what you are, a darn liar. <laughs> All right, now take it easy, Harold. Okay, George, let's move along. Boy, am I glad you were handy. That man's a wild beast. George Newton is just as guilty as anyone. Don't let him get away. It's too bad. The Harold's gone off his head. Let me see your hands, George, both of them. Hey, Mr. Pinkerton, what, what, what you putting handcuffs on me for? Only for a few minutes, George, until we can book you and find an empty cell for you. You, you were listening. Well... Huh? Voices carry. And the chief of police and I were right there in the next cell. George Newton, you're under arrest. A charge is murder. Every dollar from the train robbery, except what Harold and Elizabeth had spent on their wild vacation, was recovered. Their marriage, of course, was invalid. Both Harold Black and George Newton stood trial for the Rock Island robbery and the murder of the express messenger, Nicholas Kelsey. I shall return shortly to report to you the verdict. The trial of the two Rock Island Railroad robbers was a quick one. One juryman, however, did not believe in capital punishment. So they were sent to the penitentiary for life. Over the years, the Pinkertons never boasted of their achievements. When asked, all they would say was, it's all in a day's work. Diligence, doggedness, studying character, knowing your man. That was their day's work. That was the Pinkerton method. Our cast included Ian Martin, Lloyd Batista, Nat Poland, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.